Yeah, will the shorter piece have a larger resistance or smaller resistance? Smaller, right? The resistance is proportional to the length. Shorter length, smaller resistance. Yeah, okay. So we've got this idea, the resistances. Uh, let's see here. What was the other thing that I was going after here? Seems like we might need something like the total length. Right. The, so if the resistance is proportional to the length, it seems like I would have something like the total length is equal to. Shoot, in my head, I want to say three, th three point three plus one times L. Is that right? What's excuse me? No, I'm, I know I'm proportional to the length. What's the what's the piece I'm missing here? Rho L over A, the total resistance equals the sum of the two resistances. Got it. Okay. Second question. Sorry. No, I got it. Are these two resistors in series or parallel? Just looking at it. If I take a wire and I cut it, say right here, are these two resistors in series or in parallel? They're in series. And when I'm dealing with resistors in series, you can think of the total resistance as being the sum of the two individual resistors. Wow. OK. Now we're golden. Now we got it. Because the total resistance would just be, I'll say, rho, the resistivity of the material times the total length divided by A. And over here, I've got an expression. I've got 3.3 times R2 plus R2. It's too bad I don't have a D2. That'd be nice. Is that, is that okay so far? Now here's the, the last piece. I'll take the resistivity L over A. I'm gonna leave that left piece the same. I've got 3.3 plus one. And now I'm gonna substitute in an expression for resistor two. It is the resistivity of the material times the length of piece two divided by the area. Now keep in mind, when I cut the wire, I am not changing that cross-sectional area. The only thing, I'm not changing the material it's made out of. The only thing I'm changing is how long that segment is, right? Instead of being a distance of L, I'm going to call it a distance of L2. And then we can say, oh, goody, goody. Right, what cancels out here? Green, green sounds good. We say, oh, goody, goody. Because we kept the material the same, so the resistivity should cancel. We kept the cross-sectional area the same. I was just cutting it. Let's assume that I can cut it without smashing it or deforming it. Okay. So we keep those cross-sectional areas the same. And so I end up with this expression that says the total length is equal to 3.3 plus 1 times the length of segment two. And then I say what factor of L is L2? I think I say what factor of L is the shorter piece? So what I'm looking for is essentially, you get this one over 4.3 times L is equal to L2. So I'm just asking for that number. The, the one over 4.3 is just the 4.3. Uh, how did I have it phrased? Uh, oh, okay. I think I had it as what's the factor, so I think it would be 1 over 4.3. Yeah. D double check me on the phrasing, but yeah, I think that's right. Yeah. 
So you know right away, before you start the problem, I better end up with something less than one. So it, the, the problem's really highlighting the fact that the resistance is proportional to the length of the resistor. You take a bar, you cut it in half, the individual resistances are proportional to the length of each of the segments. And that comes in right here, right? You can say that the, the first, the, the resistor one has a length of 3.3, .3, and then resistor two has that, that, that piece in there. Oh, I forgot. Does that get you going? I mean, it gets you going, it takes you the whole way. Sorry, I kind of, you know, I should have stopped. Other questions? Uh, duplicate slide. That way we'll have that. Okay. Yes. Uh, number nine, where it asks you to find the current and then the magnitude in the electric field in each section. Oh, uh, so it's giving you like a, a wire with the current running through? Yeah. Is that right? And the standard, there's a current of the area in the So off the top of my head, neither. I want to read this one more time. Okay, so I have the same material, but I'm changing the area. Right? Yeah. There's a current of one in the point seven or so, 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 so. Okay. Right. Okay, it's a funnel. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's a funnel. Quick. Funnel. Where's the water moving faster? You take a funnel, you fill it up with water. Is the water moving faster at the wide area spot or the, the spout spot, the, the narrow area? The narrow. In fact, you could do this with the garden hose too, right? Water's flowing out. If you decrease the area of the opening, the speed of the water increases, right? You put your thumb over the water hose, all of a sudden, pssst, right? You take your thumb off and the, 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 the speed decreases. Put it back on, pssst, you know, right? So the same idea. So the, the, the question nine, the, the <laughs> let me see if I can get a couple extra slides in here. Otherwise, I'm just going to keep writing over stuff. Do this from from the front side. Yeah. Yeah. So the idea um, for number nine, the idea is uh, now I'll draw I'll draw it like this. Uh, so you basically have one diameter of a, a wire that's some length. So this is you know some length and some cross sectional area, and then it goes down to a second wire that has it's made out of the same material but it has a different length and a different cross-sectional area. And just like, and uh, you're running a current through. So we'll say that the capital I in, so you're running a current through and you're running some current out. Now the first question, just like water, if you're thinking about water coming into a hose and you narrow the spout of the hose, what happens to the speed of the water? You put your thumb over the hose opening, what happens to the speed of the water? Increases. Increases. In other words, if you decrease the cross-sectional area of the hose, the speed of the water goes up. And it works the opposite way too. If you increase, if you happen to increase the cross-sectional area of the hose, the speed of the water would have to go down. In fact, uh, let's see, this is this is how you maintain water pressure, for example. One thing that you can do is as you have more lines branching off, say you have a big water main, how do you maintain pressure? Well, as you branch lines off of your main water main, you also decrease the diameter of the water main. So that as water gets siphoned off to say different dorms, 
you decrease, you, you have less water, so you decrease the cross-sectional area so that, that less water keeps moving at the same rate. And if you didn't do that, if you kept the pipe the same and just had water coming off, then the water pressure would decrease as you went further down the pipe. Right, the people at the end on Garrett Street and their little duplex would have zero water pressure. Uh, let's see, where's the other place I've seen this? Double check, I don't know if it's at the Horner Center, uh, but it, they might do this with air vents as well. Have you ever looked at the ceiling and seen the air vents? And they, as they go along the air vent, they start getting narrow, where they're narrower in size. Have you ever seen this? Like in build, I don't know if the Horner Center has it. I know my church has it, I noticed it one time and I was like, oh, wait a minute. Right. It's the same idea, though, is that as the air vents let some air down, they get narrower so that the air pressure stays the same through the whole pipe. So that there's still air blowing at that top exit. No, maybe. I'm trying to think of some other example. Those are the two that I've noticed. Okay. So what's going on here is that so, okay, so if I decrease the area, if the area of the second part is less than the area of the first, what can you tell me about the outgoing current, I'll say out, as compared to the ingoing current? Just curious. In which situation are charges moving faster? Oh, maybe I should say that. Let me do it that way instead. Excuse me, that's a terrible. Maybe I should do it this way. V, V in, and V out. If I decrease the area, what can you tell me about the outgoing speed as compared to the ingoing speed? I'm sorry? Yeah, yeah, since I decrease the area, I'll say V in will be less than V out. Right, it's going to speed up as you're you're oh, now we're dealing with electrons instead of water, but your electrons are going to be faster as they exit as compared to when they enter. Is that okay? Is that okay? Right, like narrow the pipe. That means that you have to the, it has to go faster. Uh, okay, so we've got an idea about what's going on here. If I narrow the pipe, the electrons go faster. Now, remind me of some of the questions that it asks, Isaiah. Um, the electric field, it asks for the current of the first portion, and it asks for the electric field of the first portion, the electric field of the second portion, mm -hmm. and then the change in electric potential over the entire thing. Does it give a change in potential right. anywhere else? Yes, for the potential difference. Uh, the first portion. Yeah, with the, does it give any other information or is that all it gives? It gives the length and diameter of each of the wires <laughs> and then the amp of the current. Okay, so it gives the current. Yeah. Okay, so it's giving the incoming current. Okay, that, that's the piece of information I was looking for. Or, well, some, that, that piece of information should so be it enough. It gives the current in a smaller section. It gives the current in the smaller section. There we go. Okay. So it gives us I out. I, yeah, I think that's enough. I was like, I was looking for another piece of information and that, that should be enough to do it. Okay. So we've argued that V out is higher than V in, right? We, now thinking about our water, the outgoing water is going to be faster than the incoming water. So we've got to somehow think about, I'm, I'm trying to, I'm trying to work through it in my head as well. But somehow I want to relate how quickly the electrons are moving to the current. So how are we going to do that? If I stand here and I count the I stand here and count, and I know the speed, then I know how many electrons are going to pass me in a certain amount of time. So if I take the speed times get the number of electrons, then 
sorry, I'm just, like I said, I'm just trying to work through this in my head as well. I'm a little off. Okay. But what I want to think of is if I stand at the side of the road here, if I stand at the side of the road here and I watch, what can you tell me about the number of charges that pass this line as versus if I were standing here watching? I just have one question. How yeah. do you know like which direction the current is flowing? Oh, uh, it doesn't matter. So I just I just arbitrarily drew it going from left to right. Okay. But uh, I think all of the ideas that we've discussed so far, it's uh sorry, wool log. Yeah. Wool log? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, with I'll say without without loss of generality. So sorry, sometimes uh, sometimes I'll say wool log. So what I mean by is I just arbitrarily chose it going from left to right, but that will not affect the overall applicability of the solution. Okay. So without loss of generality, I said let's let's say it goes from left to right. We could have done the same thing, saying it goes right to left, and argued the exact same stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So no arbitrary fielder's choice. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. So back to the question again. I'm I'm just kind of working through things. I don't know exactly the answer off the top of my head. Okay. So you're thinking, oh, Greg knows the answer. No, I don't. I'm working through it right now. Okay. I should know the answer, but like, I don't. I know I can get the answer. I just don't know the exact path. But what can you tell me? Say if you stood on this side of the road, on this right here, and you're counting charges. How would that compare to if you were sitting here at the side of the road, licking your ice cream with your blimp overhead, counting charges? They're the, they're the same, right? The charge that enters in this pipe must exit that pipe. It's the same thing if you're dealing with hoses and I said, well, sit by the large diameter hose and count the number of water molecules that go by and sit by the small diameter hose and count the number of water molecules that go by, you would tell me I get the same number. The number of water molecules that come in the big hose have to go through the lower hose, the smaller hose. Yay, yeah, yeah, nay? Yeah. Yeah, yes? Is that because the bigger hose has more area, so they might not be going that much more? Yeah, 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 you've got the right idea. Is that because it's a larger area, it moves slower so that you actually get the same volume? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So a smaller cross sectional area means that it has to go faster to get the same volume. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so it's the same charge that passes each of these lines. In a given amount. So, so if I sit there and I count for 10 seconds, I should get the same amount of charge passing either of those lines. Is that okay so far? So let's get an idea of that. So let's say I sit here for 10 seconds and I count charge, that means that any charge that's upstream, in fact, this is, I'm thinking of this volume thing, any charge that's upstream within 10 seconds, I should count. Right? If I sit there and count for 10 seconds, that means charges upstream will pass me during that 10 seconds. So what you could think of is, in some time interval, all of the charge in this volume should be counted. Is that, is that okay so far? So what's the volume of that cylinder? We'll say that the volume is the area of the cylinder, and I need to get some sort of distance here. I'm going to call it, uh, for lack of a better term, 
I'm going to call it the speed times my time interval. If I take the speed of the water times my time interval, that tells me the length, and I multiply by the cross-sectional area, that gives me my volume. And we said that, hey, that has got to be equal to, well, let's see, we, we should probably take a volume and think about charges instead, shouldn't we? If I want the total amount of charge in that volume, what should I multiply by? I'm just curious. I don't think it'll play a role, but I just thought I would ask. If I have a volume and I want to find the amount of charge in that volume, you multiply by the charge density. Did I mention charge density in this class? I can't remember. No? Okay. Forget about it. I mean, essentially, all I want to say is that, hey, I think I can forget about it. Uh, the, 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 all of the charge, dens the charge density would be the charge per volume. So if I know the charge density, I can get the charge per volume. All right, I can get the amount of charge in that volume. Uh, let's see. This would be related to stuff like, uh, I think the charge density would be related to the, the um, like body center cubic or face center cubic, yada, yada, yada. I think the charge density should be related to that stuff. Right, because if you're talking pack, packing efficiency, if you're talking packing efficiency of atoms, you're essentially talking about how much charge can you pack in a unit cell. So that I think packing efficiencies are related to charge per unit volume as well. Are you might body center cubic, face center cubic. There's something else that I don't remember at all. Uh, body center, face center. What's the ones that are just on the corners? No, barking up the wrong tree. Okay. Yeah. Well, okay. We'll leave it there. Well, okay. So, uh, so the idea though would be is that the amount of charge contained in say this volume should be the amount of charge that gets contained in this volume. So I should write this as area two times V out times my time interval, delta T. I'm trying to figure out how to relate. Oh, yeah. I'm trying to, to think about how do we relate a speed to a current. Right, because I'm talking about the speed of electrons flowing through this wire. But at the end of the day, what I really need is a current. I want to say that the current, uh, the charge is the same. So the current times the time interval will be the same. So I think I do need that charge density in here. It's unfortunate. I want to I want to include it because I need to have some sort of way of saying how much charge passes. You guys are gonna have to tell me if I've lost you. Are you still following? Because what I'm trying to do, we I I've got an expression that kind of relates the speeds in the two pipes, but what I need is to relate the currents, not the speeds. Now, what I want to say is that because I'm dealing with the exact same material, I want to say that the currents are going to be proportional to the speeds. Right? Because I, both of these wires are made out of the same material, that means they would have the same, if you will, charge density, which means the current flowing through the wire should be proportional to the speed. I'm sure there's a better way for me to explain this, but I have to think about it a little more. What I, what I want to do is I want to say, okay, really what I want to say is something like um, the current flowing through the wire is going to be proportional to the speed. Any 
And if I can do that, then I think every, uh, let's see here. Current through the R is going to be proportional to the speed. So it have to be the speed multiplied by the charge density times the area. So the charge density times the speed times the area is going to give you the current. This would be coulombs per meter cubed. This would be meters per second. This would be meters square. That will give you yes. Okay, I got it. If I use, uh, do I want to use N? What do you usually use N in? N is usually molar mass or uh, moles per, what do you use little N, N for? Number of moles. Number of moles, okay. Capital N is number of atoms, right? So I don't want to use either of these because that, that kind of conflicts with things that you already used. So I'm going to call the charge per volume. I'm just going to call it rho. So if I put a rho in here, what ends up happening if charge per unit volume, if I multiply by an area in a speed, that tells me the current. Now we could check this with units. Rho is coulombs per meter cubed. The speed is in meters per second, and the area is in meters squared. I'll, I'll put this, it, does that equal a coulomb per second is the question. And we get meters cubed in the numerator that cancels the meters cubed in the denominator. And so we indeed get coulombs per second equals, okay. so. Everything works out there. So what I want to say is that the current flowing through a wire can be given by the cross-sectional area of the wire, the speed at which the electrons are flowing through the wire, times how many electrons per unit volume there are. The, the charge density tells you how many electrons can actually flow through the wire. Are there 10 charges per unit area or unit volume? Is there 50? No. The, the upshot is, is that, I mean, the reason I'm curious, the reason I'm you notice I have a V and an A here, and I have a V and A here, right? I could call this current one uh, divided by the charge density of the material times the time interval. Uh, is that what I want to do? Uh, what do I want to do here? Because then, then everything cancels out and I get that the currents are the same. is the charge. I feel like it's somewhere right in here. It's lurking here. This is the volume. If I multiply by a row, that gives me the total charge. The time intervals are the same. The rows are the same. And so that I get the area of one V in equals the area of two V out. And I feel like I gotta use this. This will give me my current. But I also feel like that's too far. I know this is the right path. I'm not quite seeing the right way through. Yeah. Are you trying to use the density of electrons? That's what V in and V out are. Okay. Yes. Yeah, you're right. Like, uh, excuse me, the terminology was, hey, are you using the drift speed of the electrons? That's what this is. So this would be called the drift speed. Right here. I, I know I'm right there. It's just a matter of getting it in the right way. Let me come back to it. 
I'm close, but it's not it's not quite clicking. Essentially, I, I think what ends up happening, I mean, like looking at these things, what I really want to say is that the, the ratio of the areas is going to end up giving you the inverse ratio of the currents. But I, I think I'm substituting something in poorly here because I see stuff canceling out so that I get the current n is equal to current n, which disturbs me slightly. So I got, I got to think about that a little bit more. Basically, uh, yeah, basically I'm seeing the current in is equal to the current out, which is not quite what I'm thinking of in my head. So I've got something just slightly off. So let me come back to it. Let me write something up and send it out. Because off the top, off, off the cuff, I know that this is close, but I'm, I'm missing one little piece here. So are we missing information for us, bro? You're not missing information. It's that I'm not putting it together off the cuff in my head correctly. So I know that I need to use something like this, and I know I'm convinced that I need to be thinking about the volume. I'm just not quite getting it together in the right way. This is where, incidentally, you run into it. This is where you take your piece of paper, you set it aside, and you just start from scratch again. The only issue is this: I don't think it's a good way. I don't think it's a good use of time for me to spend another 15 minutes hacking it out when I'm not. It's not immediately apparent in my head. And I don't want to take another 15 minutes of your time hacking it out. That's that's a big thing. So let me let me sit down after after lecture and just like write it out on a piece of paper and get it get it straight in my head and then I can email it to you guys. No. But it's it's indeed like along this way. I need to think about the volumes, I need to think about the drift speed, and then put those two together. Essentially, it's that the drift speed increases because the area goes down. And then it's just a matter of relating the drift speed to the current to get it all, all put together. Once you have the current incidentally, once you have the current, you have all the physical dimensions to get the resistance, and so you can get the potential drop across each of the pieces. So the whole the whole problem, the whole crux of the problem lands on this first part about getting the, the currents. And yes. You use the potential drop on the electric field, like would it be you divide that by the distance travel? Yeah, I think that's a, that's the right idea. I think. Yeah. So we're going to approximate these things as parallel plate capacitors, I think. Uh, let's see here. Yeah, I think that's OK. Yeah. So but I, I'd argue the crux of the problem comes in on the first part. Let me think about that just a little bit more. I know I'm right there. It's just a matter of getting it together. Yeah, I'm running out of battery, too. So like must be nice just to say, hey, I'm running out of juice, and you have somebody else give you juice for you. Uh, OK, so I bombed that one. That's OK. You bomb them every once in a while. You, you tear up. Don't tear up the piece of paper. I've learned this years ago. Because you convince yourself you did it wrong. You tear up the piece of paper. You start from scratch. And then you realize halfway through that the way you just tore up was actually the right way to do it. You've never had this experience? It's a painful experience. You know what paper is, right? Take trees, cut it down, melt them down, put them into a pulp, bleach it. You guys okay? I mean, I know I'm off, but that's because I just muddled my way through 15 minutes of physics. I get no response. There's like any other questions. Yeah, go ahead, Ben. Uh, so I know like the voltmeter and the ammeter they measure each, but do they affect like the circuit in other ways? Oh, okay, good. This is one I can answer. Thank you. Redemption. General science. Okay, so this doesn't this this goes beyond just you know this course. Okay. In general, when you take a measurement, what's the one thing you want to make sure the measurement doesn't do? affect the data. In other words, you don't want the way that you make the measurement to affect the thing you're trying to measure. Okay. That's like number one rule. So uh, the question is, OK, so how what does first of all, what does a voltmeter actually measure? Or what's a voltmeter supposed to measure? And you use this in lab. It's a little little thing that. 
delta V. It is supposed to measure the potential difference between one point in the wire and another point in the wire. Okay. So you have some circuit. I'll draw this as some black box, right? You have some circuit. Okay. And some output. And what you do is you want to measure the potential drop from one side of the circuit to the other. And you want to darn well make sure that it does not affect the operation of the circuit itself. Now, what do I mean by affect the operation of the circuit? You do not want it to change the current running through the circuit, and you don't want it to change the potential drop across the what we call the terminals, the two places where you make the measurement. Those are the two things that you do not want your measurement device to do. Okay. Good so far? Now, how is this done? With a voltmeter, you want to measure two locations. All right, we'll call it location A and location B. How should I hook up my voltmeter? In series or parallel? Is there any, I mean, yeah. How should I hook up my voltmeter to this circuit? In series, okay. So what that would mean is that, okay, well, I'll take connection A and I'll hook it up to my voltmeter. Okay. And now the question is, how do I connect it to part B if it's in series? Right? In order to connect it to the circuit, I got to go like this, but that's not connecting to location B. This is connecting to some other location. No, nothing risks, nothing gain. Did I use that phrase in Shark Tank? My wife likes watching Shark Tank. We were watching this one just a couple days ago where a lady's mortgaging her house to start her business. She's dropped like a million dollars into her business and she still hasn't made a profit. And Mark Cuban's like, you're mortgaging your house. You're like, you're putting your livelihood at stake. You know what her response is? Excuse the expression. I just found it really funny. No balls, no babies. And I was like, that is awesome. I would not mortgage my house for it, but nothing risk, nothing gain. Okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We can't do this in we can't do this in series because if we want to do the voltmeter in series. That means that we would have to run the connection over here and we, we affect the circuit. We have now changed what the circuit looks like from the point of view of the voltmeter. Because we want to make the, we want to connect to points A and B. So what we have to do for the voltmeter is we need to run the connection in parallel. Number one, because that does not affect what the circuit looks like. Next question, that, that doesn't affect the change in potential across the circuit, I guess is maybe a different way to say it. Next question, how much current you've introduced a parallel branch? How much current do you actually want to flow through that branch? You've now introduced an extra connection. Do you want that connection to siphon off any of the current? Survey says, no, because what did I say that you want to keep the same? When you do your measurement, you need to make sure that the potential draw across the circuit and the current flowing through the circuit remains unaffected. So if you put an extra pathway in for current to flow through, you want to somehow try to prevent current from going through that path. If at all possible because that affects how the circuit operates. Your measurement device affects the circuit. Based on that, oh, you do not want current to flow through this loop. If you can, you, you want to prevent current from flowing through that loop easily. Now, unfortunately, you know it's good scientists. First of all, a little bit of current's going to go through that loop. And in fact, it has to. Because in order for the voltmeter to work, a little bit of current has to go through. The trick is, is that the current that goes through this loop, you want to make it really small compared to the current that the circuit uses. And voltmeters do this automatically, so you don't have to worry about that. Okay? 
voltmeters inherently try to prevent current from going through this loop. And I say inherently, if you do not want current going through that loop, what can you tell me about the resistance of the voltmeter? If you want to prevent current from going through the loop that the voltmeter is in, what can you tell me about the internal resistance of the voltmeter? Really high or really low? Really high. Really high. Voltmeters, that analog voltmeter that you have in lab, and it inherently has a high resistance to it. High, how high? I want to say it's something probably like 10 mega ohms. So your circuit down here might have, you know, a resistance of 100 ohms. You hook up a voltmeter with 10 million ohms of resistance. That's going to essentially force one ten millionth of the current. So this would be something like one ten millionth of the overall current to go through the upper loop rather than the circuit itself. I'm just ballparking. Okay. So inherently, voltmeters have a huge resistance so that when you put them in parallel, it doesn't affect the circuit or it affects the circuit to a negligible extent. I can't remember. Is this kind of what the question's asking about? Yeah, so okay. if you were to actually stick it in the circuit, like where the, where the black box is, it would affect the circuit. Uh, I'm sorry? So if you were to actually stick it in the circuit, it wouldn't affect the circuit. Yeah, so what would happen, knowing that it has a high resistance, if we go back to sticking it in series, here's the circuit, and then we have point B here. If we stick it in series, what can you tell me about the current that's going to flow through that, that, that branch now? Knowing that the resistance, the internal resistance of this thing is huge, what's the current going to be? Less, all right? Yeah, so you're gonna, if you put it in series, it's gonna, you're gonna, it's gonna drive the current down. It's gonna affect the thing you're trying to measure. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. The the well, you tell me, if you put a huge resistor in series with your circuit, will that affect the amount of current flowing through the circuit? Yeah. Yeah. So and, in parallel, but not uh, in parallel, that's the idea, is it shouldn't. Yeah. So if you put it in parallel, it shouldn't affect the light bulb brightness by design. Whereas if you put it in series, you'll notice the light bulb gets dim. In fact, so dim, you probably won't even see it. It'll probably not even work. Yeah, yeah, that's a good, good question. Okay. Question about the voltmeter. And because you want to measure between two different locations, that all, that inherently means you got to you got to have it in parallel. So you can put out location one and location two. Okay. Question: What's the purpose of an ammeter? What does an ammeter do? It measures it measures the current. In other words, you want to make sure that. Next question: To measure the current. Do you want to give the current options? If you want to measure the entire current, let me an analogy. If I want to measure how many people are coming into the science center, okay, and I stand at the front doors and count, am I going to get the right number? Survey says, no, why? Other doors. There are other doors that people can come in at. Right? In order for me to get the amount of current flowing through a circuit, I have to make sure that I'm counting, quote unquote, all the paths that something can use to get into the circuit. Good so far? So we have two options here. Let's say I have a circuit. Again, I'll just, this is usually called a black box, but I'll just call it the circuit. And I have my exit point, I have my entrance point. Okay. And I've got two situations now. Number one, situation one is that I connect my ammeter in parallel. Situation two is I connect it in series. 
Oops, circuit. I can't spell circuit. You get the idea. Okay, well, I say that, and then I'll try it anyway. In which of these two situations is the ammeter going to tell you how much, how much current is flowing through the circuit? The one in series. Let's look at the one in parallel for a second to get an idea. Right here, current comes in and it sees that it has a choice. It has the option of flowing through the top branch. It has an option of just continuing on. Now the current that decides to go through the top branch gets counted. But the current that decides to just go straight through the circuit the ammeter never measures. That's like you're standing at the front door measuring how many people come in and out, ignoring the fact that there's another door. There's another path that the current can take. If you want to hook an ammeter up to a circuit and you want to know how much current is coming through the circuit, you have to put the ammeter in series. You have to make sure that it counts all of the pathways you will. Question. Bearing in mind that our measurement device should not affect the operation, right? The thing that we're trying, how we're doing the measurement should not affect the thing we're trying to measure. What can you tell me about the internal resistance of an ammeter? It's got to be really low. If we have to put the ammeter in series with our circuit, that means we don't want it to affect the current running through the circuit. Well, in order for it to not affect the current running through the circuit, that means that the resistance of the ammeter has to be really low. You want it to be as close to a perfect wire as possible. So we'll say low resistance, low resistance. Um, how low? You probably get it on the order of mi milliohms. So it's not quite a perfect wire, but it's close. Yes? So would, would a voltmeter or an ammeter affect the brightness of a bulb more? It depends if you put it in series or parallel, I think. Does it get, I assume it gives you more specifications on that. Or is it a free response? Oh, wait, it's great. It says when it's attached in series. Oh, when it's attached in series. Okay, so now, now you've got an idea. Yeah. Again, though, this comes back down to the fact that you don't want the thing that you're doing in the measurements to affect the thing you're trying to measure. Okay. Now, uh, I know that your, your ammeters and volt, well, if you're using the analog one, which I think, did you use the analog ones or did you use the digital ones? Analog, you're reading off a needle. There's a set of digital ones in there and pay attention, at some point I assume that you'll use the digital ones. And even if not, when you get out, you know, like if you go out and buy a, a digital voltmeter, which is just a handy tool to have around, okay? Like, oh, is this, is this wall socket bad? You can just get out your digital voltmeter and check it real fast. Or is this battery bad? You know, they're 10 bucks, something like that. They're just a useful piece to have around. But if you ever play around with one, and I'll, I'll try to bring one in as well, you'll notice that there are three, usually there's three plugs. If you want to do volt if you want to do a voltage measurement, the plugs go into two of the slots. But if you want to do the amp meter measurement, if you want to measure current, you actually have to pull one of them out and put it into a different slot. And I say, well, that seems silly. Why do you have to do that? Why can't I just leave the banana? We're smart enough. It's 2020. Why can't we make a volt, a, an ammeter device where I don't have to swap the banana plugs? I don't have to move a wire. That's why. It's because from the standpoint of the internal resistance, when I have the two plugs in one set, there is a high resistance between the two inputs to make sure that current doesn't go through. Whereas if I want to do an ammeter measurement, if I want to measure current, I need a low resistance. Well, what that means is physically when I unplug it and move it to a different plug, I've now put it into a low resistance mode. 
so it doesn't affect the circuit again. Oh, lastly, I should say, if I do this, if I put an ammeter into parallel with the circuit, oh, yes. It shouldn't penalize you if it's answered the first time. Are you guys all experiencing this? I have that. Okay, thanks for letting me know. I'll go back. Is it, that's this homework assignment? Yeah. No, it shouldn't be penalizing you for the first submission. The first submission, it should be fine. It should be every subsequent submission. No, I answered like four and five correctly the first time and then it's still. Okay, I'll go back and take a look at it. Uh, well, it, does it say 0. 0.9 out of 0. 0.9? Wait, it says this submission attracted a penalty of 0.10, but I Okay, I'll go back and look. That's that's weird. It shouldn't be doing that at all. Okay. Huh. Okay, that's weird. Uh, okay, so uh, if I take an ammeter and I put it into parallel with my circuit, I should ask this: Where's all the? Where's essentially all of the current going to be flowing? Which branch? It's going to be, remember the ammeter has a low resistance. So if I do my ammeter in parallel, all of the current's going to be flowing this way. Essentially, all of it's going to go through this path and come out, and none of it's going to go through your circuit. Now, here's the danger. Be careful. I don't know how much you're going to use this. I don't know if this will come in, in you know, like in the lab at some point. The danger, the ammeter still gives you a value. Right? The ammeter is doing exactly what you told it to do. You hooked it up to a circuit and said, tell me how much current is running through, how much current is, run, is running through you. So the ammeter in this case will probably give you a value. But it won't tell you that it's not the, it, it won't tell you, you you've used it wrong. Right? It's doing exactly what you told it to do. Same thing, if you do this, if you put a voltmeter in series with your circuit, the voltmeter is going to give you a value. It's going to give you a value of zero. It won't tell you you're doing it wrong. It'll say, you want a value, here you go. And it's not going to tell you this isn't the value you want. So you got to be careful. And that's my warning to you. Now, I don't know if that will ever pop up in your professional careers or not. I can tell you that when I'm dealing with the circuits class, I see it happen all the time. And when, I, when I'm dealing with people that, that are still learning circuits and trying to figure stuff out, I say, well, this voltmeter reads zero, it must be broken. I said, did you use it in series or parallel? Oh, in series. Well, yes, that would make sense because the voltmeter has a huge internal resistance. The current's going to be zero, so it's going to give you zero. Zero drop across the resistor. Yeah, I agree. So just be careful. It'll, it'll prevent you from making, I mean, all you have to do is prevent your colleague from making one silly mistake to save the company. Right? Maybe. Incidentally, make $50 mistakes, not $1,000 mistakes. That's the other one. You will make mistakes. Make sure it's $50 mistakes, not $1,000 mistakes. No? Maybe. I had to order microscope objectives at one point. Let me tell you, when you're dropping five grand on a microscope objective, you want to make sure you don't make a mistake on it. And we nailed it with that 20x fluorescent objective. Water immersion, no. Water immersion 20x fluorescent microscope objective. It was only like six thousand dollars. You don't want to screw that one up. Almost as bad as the monochrome camera that we got, right? That's like 10. Make $50 mistakes, not $1,000 mistakes. Okay. Monochrome camera gets blown light. What does that mean? Oh, I'm sorry? Does it mean in monochrome camera gets blown Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. But you get, uh, you guys are familiar, you get more, you get higher resolution with the monochrome camera than a black and white camera. Oh. 
So if you get like a 10 megapixel monochrome black and white camera, that means every pixel is registering light. Right? Whereas if you get a 10 megapixel colored camera, one quarter of the pixels measure the green, or excuse me, one quarter do the red, one half do the green, and one quarter do the blue. So you actually don't get as high of resolution. That's why monochrome cameras are more expensive. Seems very counterintuitive. And that's if you deal with microscopes. If you go into microscopes, monochrome cameras are more expensive because you're actually getting a higher resolution. So what if you were to color them as a picture from the monochrome? That's exactly what you do. So if you take a picture with a red filter, then you take the same picture with green, then the same picture with blue, and you overlay the three. Yep, that's exactly how you do it. So you have to take three pictures to get the same image, but the image is at higher resolution. Then if you just do one picture with a colored camera, then you get a lower resolution image. Yeah. You, you can get familiar with this. It's called a Bayer mosaic. Uh, oh, quick. Uh, cones, right? Cones do color. Is that right? In the back of the eye? You're looking at me like I'm Yeah, quick. Which, which color, which cones do you have more of? Red, green, or blue? Green. Yeah. Incidentally, the, the color that gets most uh, emitted by our sun is, is green and yellow. So it's not by, it's probably not by accident that our eyes develop to be the most sensitive to the green and yellow part of the visible spectrum. So you have about twice as many cones that cover green as you do red or blue. So you got, you got about a quarter, a quarter of them are red, half of them are green, and about a quarter are blue. So it turns out your color cameras, like in your cell phones, work the same way. You can think of four pixels on your camera. Okay? One of them registers red, two of them register green, and one of them registers blue. To match kind of the, so that's why when you take a picture with your phone, it kind of it looks right is because how it collects the different colors is, is roughly the same as how your eye does it in terms of proportion. Okay. So literally your, your camera on your phone has this arrangement for every four pixels. One of them has a red filter, two of them have a green filter, and one of them has a blue filter. And then when you take the picture, it interpolates the, the interceding pixels. So it looks at these two blue values and guesses what the blue value should be for that pixel. Or it looks at these two red values, and then it guesses what the value should be at that pixel. And that's how it produces the full-fledged colored image. No? You ever heard of this? This is called a bear mosaic. I think it's called a bear, bear mosaic. Mosaic. Man, okay. You guys don't look, you don't look excited about this. Should I go back to physics? Does that answer your question? Okay. Yeah. Others. Yeah. Okay, so amps times volts is equal to watts, right? Oh, let's see. Amps times volts is equal to watts. Let's think here. Uh, power is equal to let me think here. Power is equal to a charge. Oh, excuse me. Think about this. Energy is equal to a charge times a potential difference. So this would be Coulombs times a volt is equal to a joule. And then if I do a joule per second, this would be equal to a Coulomb per second times a volt. And a joule per second is a watt. And this would be current times a volt. Okay, say it again. What did you ask? Uh, amps, times volts is equal to amps times volts is equal to watts. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, like, what is watts measure? Uh, I'm sorry? Like, what is watts measure? Yeah, yeah, what is watts measure? Yeah, okay. You ever look at a light bulb? You look at it and it says 40 watts, or 10 watts, or 5 watts, joules per second. It's actually what I have right here. Uh, watts are, are basically how much energy you expend in a given amount of time. So a 40 watt light bulb uses 40 joules of energy every second. 
which seems like a lot until you realize like, well, a joule of energy is like, you know, I don't know, like your breakfast probably had, you know, a thousand, ten thousand joules of energy this morning. Uh, is that different from current? Uh, a current? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, well, I guess I did. So actually, you saw I did all of this. You probably already, well, delta U equals Q times delta V. Excuse me. That's going left to right on our organization chart. Okay. If I if I think about per unit time, so I'll just divide both sides by time. This would be what's called a uh, power. How much energy you expend in unit time. So this is power. I've got the power. Which is the thing I was going to cover today. And then I never got to it. Okay, life goes on. Uh, over here, a charge per unit time, that is your current times V. So current is the charge per unit time, whereas the power is the energy per unit time. So the same thing, like you go and you want to buy a new car, right? Say you're, you know, you want a, a hot rod and they'll say, okay, well, how much horsepower do you need? They're, they're saying how, when you, when you put your foot on the gas, how much energy are you going to need to deliver per unit time? So sometimes it's not only the amount of energy available, but also how quickly you can deliver that energy. Oh, you've got a million joules of energy, but you can only use one joule per second. That's like saying that you have a bathtub of water and you can take a shower one drop at a time. All right. So sometimes it's not only the amount of energy that you have available, but also how quickly can you get that energy? That's what the power does. Anyway. Well, I don't think I'm going to get to the power today. I can still work on the hype. I know it's like one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Oh, shoot. You see that fourth one? I want to come back and I shouldn't. I have to swing down. One, two, three, four, five, four, four, two. No? I got to count it out in my head. And then somehow I'm supposed to jump too. I don't know. Like, it's, you're supposed to do this all jumping, right? Like, I can't do it. I can't do it. Anyway, I can bounce. I didn't even have crap. Let's try it left handed. You guys want to try it with me? Why aren't you guys trying this? You haven't tried the hype yet? Oh, you, you think I'm going to let you go early? Yeah, well, yeah, of course I'm going to let you go. Get out of here. <laughs> now you don't want to do the hype? Corey's like, okay, I've had enough of this. Get out of here. Get out of here. I'll try to email you that. Um, We'll start there on Monday, or Monday. We'll start there on Wednesday, then I'll try to email a, a better discussion about that, that funnel one real fast. So let me get my head wrapped around it, and then we'll get going. No, yes, or you can stay, I don't care. Like, no. no. You can go and look at the bear mosaic. No? Somebody's got to, you can play around with the fluorescent microscope, right? No? No? Yeah. Let me tell you, the number one rule, don't touch the objective. And if you touch the objective, don't clean it with any ammonia, I think it's ammonia-based cleaners, right? Because the objectives have a film over it. And if you use like Windex or something, it takes the film off, which damages the objective. Don't do that. And don't drop the objectives. Yeah. 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 Oh. Hey, Dr. Robinson, the, are, until what time are you available today? Uh, I got a meeting at four. Um, but other than that, I don't think I have anything. I mean, I'm going to go and get some lunch and try to get my head on straight, but otherwise. Okay. I might stop. Well, I would, I we, might stop by around to, three. Can, say again? Is it okay if I stop around at three? It might not happen, but I'm just wondering if I might. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just bang on the door. All right, sounds good. Thank you. Yep, yep. You're welcome. Hey, what's cooking? Hey, oh, no.